I chose the Bible verse to start with because it's partly involved with the message and at the same time, it is a message on its own. John 3, the first three verses. There was a man, I'll read it. You can get out your Bible if you wish. I can say it's a very short uh, message. John 3, verses 1 to 3. That sound of pages flipping. <laughs> there was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. But Jesus replied to the statement saying, I tell you the truth, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. <coughs> when I was a young Christian growing up, I was puzzled by things that I read in the Bible that weren't explained. And I accepted them on faith. I didn't know why they were in there, why there was no problem with them being there. I'm going to give you just five of them, because these are the ones that affected me most. Number one, what actually happened during those missing years of Jesus' recorded life? The Buddhists believe he had gone to the Far East to learn the truth of life. That one I didn't accept. Question number two, why were the sacred scrolls, the only set they have, handed to this carpenter's son to handle? He was an illegitimate son of a lowly woodworker. How could he have a rank to actually handle them and read and teach from them? Question three, why did these men obey the command, follow me? Two words. I always thought for a long time it was God's voice it was so convincing I've known police officers and teachers <coughs> who have that kind of voice that when they say, do this, you do it. Not out of fear, but just that voice says, I've got to follow what they're saying. Question four. Why was Jesus never attacked by Judaism? Now, Judaism is the name of the church system at that time. Why was he never attacked by that when he would take the Old Testament teachings, these sacred words, and put his own twist onto it. Nobody said anything. They accepted the fact that somehow he was doing this and it wasn't breaking any rules. And lastly, when he first started out, he had huge crowds following him. Where'd they all come from? A huge crowd suddenly is following this person and he had many after that. And this is even before the free food came out. <laughs> the answer, it's in the education system in the New Testament. <clears throat> Every Jewish boy attended what was called rabbi school. Up to age 12, you learned the three R's, reading and writing arithmetic, and you memorized the first five books of the Bible. There's a lot of memorization to do with that. That's huge. Especially when the school only had one copy. So the entire group couldn't handle it. They did the whole thing orally. The teacher would say it, you'd say it after that, they'd repeat it, and then you'd say it without him and move on. But then they'd check to make sure you picked it up. This was a pretty high standard for little kids to do. And if the teachers could see that uh, you weren't going to make the June finals, they would take you aside and say, you know, you would do your family a great honor if you were to join the family business because they knew you weren't going to make it in school. Now these classes were caught up, taught up to age 12. Age 12 is when Jesus 
appears on the screen after the stories of his birth. And he shows up at age 12 with tremendous knowledge of the scriptures. And the religious leaders and whoever was talking to them were amazed. They didn't know they were talking to God in a human body. That's how he knew all this. But it's interesting. There's another part to the rabbi school. Another 18 years of education was coming up. If you stayed in it, and you made it almost to the end, it didn't quite, you would be graduating as a rabbi. But what if you got to the end of the course? You got to the end of the 18th year. Then, and only then, was your title changed. At that point, you would be called a rabbi with semeka. I hope that's the right pronunciation. If I say it fast, it's probably okay. All right, <laughs> works for you. That uh, changes over to an English word. The closest word is authority. And I'm going to use that phrase because it'll be easier to follow. Now, it's pretty obvious that Jesus could complete that course because, after all, he wrote the book. But what's also interesting, they did some research on this. Only two men had ever reached that level around that time, and they had died before Jesus' birth. So, when Jesus completed this, and there's proof which I'm going to mention later, when he completed this, this put him into a position that you would call the head rabbi for the country. The only one rabbi with authority. High as you can go, it made him the rabbi for the country. Talking to Aaron yesterday on that, mentioned the fact that our conversation uh, a week or so back got me up to say, okay, let's put this together as a message. When we looked up the information on these rabbis, there's a Jewish list, and they list up to a point of Jesus' birth. Then there's a gap before another one comes in. They did not recognize the fact that the Messiah had come 2,000 years ago. They still don't recognize it now. They had that gap in their list of rabbis for the country, head rabbis, still there with a the space. Now, do your mathematic. Age 12 plus 18 years adds up to 30. What was Jesus' age when he appeared again on the scene? He was 30. This is an explanation. At this point in my message, you could say it's a possible explanation for the 30 years. The question is, how do we know he actually did make it there? Now we go back to the Bible. We go back to the questions that I had a hard job working with. Question one was, what happened in that time period? Our answer, he was being educated in the synagogue schools. Synagogue schools were all throughout the country. No one would ever be called rabbi back in those days unless you genuinely were one. I taught photography for Georgian College, Ministry of Natural Resources, Huntsville High School. People would occasionally call me teach or prof when I worked for the uh, college. I don't have a certificate on the wall. But people would call me that and everybody would know, okay, we're talking about Grant. Back in, in New Testament times, you never called someone a title like that unless they genuinely were a rabbi. Interestingly, even the Pharisees called Jesus rabbi. And the Pharisees were the ones that were going around trying to find something he said wrong so they would have him, let's say, removed from this position of teaching. Okay, uh, a moment here. Yeah, the 
called him rabbi twice, but the Pharisees did. Other people called him rabbi 14 times. So it's a very consistent thing. They recognized him. He was a rabbi, which is my answer to question two. Why would you handle something so sacred to an average person? He wasn't an average person. But now we come to the rabbi with authority, the highest you can go. This I had to go back to the system and find out what some of the requirements for that and what things they could do. Rabbis with authority didn't just mention, didn't just memorize the Torah. They memorized the entire Old Testament. They could recite it by name, or recite it from memory rather, of anything you want to know of a certain prophecy or whatever. The rabbi with authority could tell you, word for word, what the Old Testament said on. <coughs> rabbi with authority could have disciples. In the education back then, there are certain phrases, key words that were put together that everybody knew exactly what it meant. If someone had a, a sentence where I am would be in it, it could only be used when you're talking about God. I, back then, I couldn't say I am speaking to you. The phrase I am, that meant something special. So did the phrase, follow me. Those two words, when you heard that being said, it had to be said by a rabbi authority, and you had to obey. That's why these men gave up their jobs and followed this man who said, follow me. <clears throat> that was the answer for my third question. There's some other things they could do, though. Rabbis with authority could perform healing. They could cast out demons. But they could not raise the dead. The church gave them authority for these other things. Jesus came with the authority to raise the dead as well. And as far as what I'm talking about, um, where the Old Testament was quoted and Jesus added something new to it, that was allowed only for the rabbi of authority because he was the absolute top position. But he had to say it a certain way so people would know that he's accepting the Old Testament, but this part is being added. They would usually say, it was written, you have heard its meaning, but I tell you, or but I say. Jesus did that 15 times in scripture. Nobody questioned it. Nobody claimed it was blasphemy. The rabbi with authority had the authority to do that. And that was a question to my fourth answer, or answer or two rather. Now, the crowds. This is where Jesus pulled out a few surprises. This rabbi is 30 years old. Sorry, rabbi with authority is 30 years old. The others that had died were what considered at the time almost extreme seniors. One was, there's three of them, I believe it was. One was 65, and the other two were in their upper 50s. And that was considered to be a high age at that time. And this guy is coming out, he's 30 years old, he's half the age, with more answers to what was going on. He had gone into the temple. Now, for those who are not aware of it, there was only one temple. That was the main, absolute top limit of a worshiping location in Israel. He went in there, and he could see things were being messed up. The merchants were in there selling poor quality sacrifices, charging a high price. The money changers, they took their profit out of it. The Judaism system got a profit cut out of all of these activities. Jesus goes in and drives them out of the temple. That 
was tonight's news. That was something that no one would ever think to do. He did it. But then he said something else. He said, or he should I say, he claimed the temple was his father's home. Or sorry, his father's house. Correction. He just drove out all the corruption. And he says that this is his father's house. This is unfortunately where a few people who know his past will bring with him this Joseph. Son of Joseph. He's an illegitimate son of Joseph. He's, he's a carpenter's assistant. What is he talking about? This would draw attention to anyone who wanted to know more of what he was going to say. He just did something amazing in the biggest church, I guess you would say, in the country. Now people want to know. The first sermon he has is the Sermon on the Mount with a huge pile of people. And like I say, we haven't got to the point of the free food yet. This is just coming to see this guy and to hear. I look at that and say, okay, that's my answer to question five. Where did the big crowds all come from? He made such a huge scene that more people figured, okay, we've got to find out more about this guy. Especially, he says, is his father's house? It's Joseph's son. Jesus was indeed the rabbi with authority. Why were the sacred scrolls handed to a carpenter's son to handle and read in the synagogue? Was he not the illegitimate son of a lowly woodworker? Now they use the word carpenter, just a small clarification. In Israel, carpenters did not build houses. All they did was build furniture, doors, and roofs. The walls were always stone. So he was not a stone person, he was a carpenter. That cuts him down even more as far as the amount of work. But this illegitimate son of a lowly woodworker became the rabbi with authority. Was Jesus never attacked when he took the Old Testament scriptures and added a different meaning? Was he overruling the authority of God? No. He was the authority speaking. He wasn't getting overruled. He was doing the speaking. What actually happened during the missing years of Jesus' life? Was he really in the Far East, learning the truth of life? He was preparing his people and us to hear the way, the truth, and the life. Here's a beautiful thought for the last question that I had. May we all be in that final huge crowd listening to the words, well done, good and faithful servant. If we're not there, we're not any place important. I have a bunch of health issues that are coming up and because of them, I look forward more to hearing those words. Everything I do right now, I do on short term. All the things around the home that need to be fixed up are being fixed up. I am not looking long term. Some of you may accept this idea. It gives you a different way of looking at life. If you figure that I'm going to leave here soon. gentleman that uh, attended one of my Bible studies for a while was always getting wound up on the terrible things that are taking place in the world. And he'd love to go on and on about who's to blame and what his solution to the problem would be. And he'd do this again and again. And finally, I told him, I wasn't leaving the Bible church at the time, or the Bible study. I said to him, I'm not worried about those things. 
Because when Judgment Day comes, there is nothing they can say to account for the time that they've wasted worrying about things that are God's way of doing things, part of his plan, and you think you're going to change it and do something better? No. Acknowledge the fact that they've happened, but Judgment Day will take care. And the thing that I found about prayer for a situation, we all have an idea of how we're going to solve this problem. And it's going to solve all the other problems connected with this problem. But then when God answers a prayer, you realize, that's an answer I never thought of. He can and will do far better than our limited imagination in solving problems. For me, that eliminates a ton and a half of stress. I know people around who are living on uh, blood pressure pills and anxiety pills and everything else because they can't see someone else taking the problem. They figure they should be doing it and it puts their body into such a place where it's not working. My body's not working. The problem's not being solved. I found give it to God. I was talking to a young child one time and they were having problems sleeping. I said, why? And they told me some of the problems. as well, why don't you give it to God? He, he's up all night anyway. And suddenly, the light bulb went on. I haven't heard, uh, as far as that child's having any more sleeping problems, but they realized, that's an idea I never thought of. Give it to somebody else. No matter when I wake up in the middle of the night, give it to him. He's up already. Heaven is something to look forward to, for sure. And to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. A little slightly off topic, when I sing that phrase, I remember the time that I was in the Jehovah's Witness Hall when they're having their annual communion. And at the end of it, I was the new face in the crowd. Some of them knew I was a Christian. Others just said, it's a new guy. He's got some biblical answers that we can challenge. And they said, okay, if you, if you do all these things that you say you're going to do, what do you expect to, do, to accomplish? And I said, to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Because the JWs say, good and faithful slave. Slave is a step lower than a servant. Servant had authority. The slave had food and lodging. We are going to be servants when we hear that word in heaven. I'd like to close in a short prayer. Dear Jesus, we thank you for your word that answers every question that can trouble us. We need more time to spend meditating it, upon it, learning that you have everything in place. You've got a plan ahead of us. Everything is in place. If we put our faith in you, we can see your plan and we see your love. And we learn of these things because you put it in your word. We pray, Lord, that we'll spend more time in your word getting to know him getting to know this rabbi, this rabbi with authority, this son of God, this creator of the world, and many other titles that we could almost never come to a final list on until we love him as he loved us. These things I pray in the holy name of Jesus. Amen.